I did that thing where I turned off my windshield wipers before I turned off the car, so it stopped halfway. And then I did that thing where I opened the car door and stepped out before I turned off my headlights, so my car was beeping at me. I was nervous as I stepped out into the glistening street and walked over towards a small retaining wall and hoisted myself up on it and over a smaller barrier and made my way to the center of the Bailey Avenue bridge where it spans Dodds Avenue. I was met with a missing section of guardrail that had been knocked out days and days before by a vehicle, but was replaced with just two strips of caution tape, one holding fast, one broken and flapping in the wind, but both unable to catch someone if they were to fall in that exact spot. My heart was thumping because even though what I was doing wasn't wrong, it was illegal. In 2022, nearly 43,000 people lost their lives as a result of cars in America, according to the NHTSA. 7,800 of those were pedestrians. 7,800 people on a walk that was their last without knowing it. And this number is important for two reasons. First, it marks a 40-year high watermark for pedestrian deaths in America. And secondly, pedestrians are the canary in the coal mine. You might be thinking, OK, but wait a second. Uh, 20, 2022 was uh, a bad year, but maybe, I don't know, maybe we're just getting back to normal. Maybe we're getting things back to normal. No. As Jeff Speck puts it, you and I start and end each trip we take as pedestrians. If you make the world better for pedestrians, you make it better for everyone. Show me the, the state of pedestrians in your city, and I can tell you the health of that city the economic health, the overall safety and crime rate, the physical health. So how is Chattanooga doing in this department? The answer is not good. In 2023, by July of this year, we were at a 200% increase in pedestrian fatalities over last year. Eight months, 200%. And you might be thinking, OK, again, well, maybe 2022 wasn't that bad, and we're kind of getting back to normal. No, 2022 was bad in its own right. It was a record high of 10 years for pedestrians hit by cars. Sure, less people died, but a record for most people hit by cars. So what's the city doing to address this? Well, the city acquired a $35,000 federal grant, which they're using to print out pamphlets to tell people how to walk safer. This despite the fact that one third of deaths this year have been hit and run crashes. Running away is hardly the behavior of an innocent driver. And sadly, printing materials to help victims be less victimized is a common response when cities have this problem. It's a common but inadequate response. The city of Edmonton in Canada had a year where 200 people were hit by cars, and they decided to dig in deeper to see else, what else was going on. 49,000 other objects in their city were hit by cars that year. 5,500 of them were completely stationary. That's 5,500 things existing where they were supposed to exist, doing what they were supposed to be doing, and they still got hit. It doesn't have to be this way. When it comes to developed countries, America is one of the worst offenders when it comes to this problem. And within the states of America, Tennessee is one of the worst. Things can change, but it's going to take three separate types of awakenings. The first one, is an awakening on the individual level. That night on the bridge, I was experiencing my own personal awakening. I was sitting there because earlier, a few days earlier, I was driving and I noticed that missing section of guardrail and saw someone stumbling by and I thought, you know what? The city should have put something up temporary. They knew that wasn't gonna go up fast. They should have put something up temporary for the benefit of pedestrians. And then I quickly realized, ah, but if they did that and they failed, they would be held liable. And then I thought, well, I could put something up. I should put something up temporary. And then realizing, oh, but if that fails, I'm held liable. And in that moment, I had a realization. I thought, who is being held liable for the status quo? Because if I went to bed that night and someone fell, no one would know that I was responsible, but I would know. I could do something, so I should do something. That afternoon, I went and spoke with my neighbor across the street, Jeremy, and I don't remember if it was his idea or my idea, but as a result of the conversation, kicked out a plan to do it in two goes. Go out and measure it in one trip, which is what I was doing that night in the rain, and then come back with it mostly assembled and put it in place. 
Now, I didn't want to take credit for this. I didn't know how illegal this was. Uh, in fact, this is the first time I'm admitting publicly that I was even associated with this project. <laughs> However, I didn't want the city to take credit for this because they didn't do anything. So I created a fake organization. I called it the Chattanooga Urbanist Society. It sounds official, right? And then I made a logo with a brick and a certain font. It looked official. And then I hand stenciled out a, that logo and spray painted it on the guardrail I was going to put in place. It ended up, that looked less official. But <laughs> I put it in place uploaded a video to TikTok, and it got 150,000 views with zero followers in that account. This imaginary group that I created was very much becoming a real group. Please note, I wasn't uninvolved before this. I showed up the city council for public comment for things like this. I had my own channel where I made TikTok videos. I even showed up and voted in local off-season elections. But this was the first time I took direct action, and that flipped the switch. Moving forward, I couldn't not do this because I saw the difference one person could make. A person without a lot of money, a person without a lot of time, a person who was willing to just assert themselves and do something. And when you take direct action, the individual ends up being shaped as much as the environment that they're intending to shape. Direct action is when you don't wait for permission, you don't wait to be seen as worthy by society to take that action, you just get up and do it. And this specific genre of action is known as tactical urbanism. It's when cities refuse to submit to the process of bureaucracy when safety is urgent, and they go out without permission and shape a physical environment that's more equitable, safe, and sometimes just more enjoyable for the pedestrians of the city. Direct action is the key to an individual awakening. If you don't know the difference that you can make, you're going to give up and resign to the fact that nothing will change. The second awakening happens on the level of community. It wasn't long after this that it was decided we should start looking for other needs that pedestrians have in our community, and one of them in particular had to do with seating. Out of the 1,200 bus stops around town provided by CARTA, our local transit agency, only 56 are covered and include a bench. So we started prototyping what it might look like to make a bench out of uh, uh, leftover wood from a construction site and decided on this plan to start building benches for bus stops. And as if on cue, the city of Chattanooga removed nine benches from downtown to discourage the, pre discourage the presence of people that they deemed undesirable. That same month, Mitchell Silver, the former head of the New York City Parks and Rec Department, was giving a, speak lo a speech locally and said, if you do not have enough seating, that's your cue to build more, not to remove what you have. I caught up with him a few days after the event, and I talked to him, and I told him uh, that he was really bringing the fire, and he was like, you know what? I'm not a controversial person. I had no idea that was the case with Chattanooga. If I had known, I probably wouldn't have said anything. I'm not that type of guy. But I remember in that moment thinking, I, I'm kind of that type of guy. <laughs> because here's the thing. If, if you remove a bench for people you deem undesirable, who, by the way, probably need that bench more than anyone else, right? You also remove it for that 80-year-old man in the twilight years of his autonomy that uses as a stopping point halfway when he walks his dog. You remove it for the woman who parked far away because she couldn't afford parking for her appointment downtown and needs an ad hoc changing table for her infant. You remove it for the doctor in residency down the street who has a 24-hour shift and 30 minutes in which she can eat her lunch and no longer has a place to sit. When you remove a bench for anyone, you remove it for everyone. So, we, we started to hatch a plan. I reached out to the local uh, street artist, Art for All Peoples. You might see their stuff on telephone poles around town. And I, I'd never met them before, and I said, hey, look, I want to build this bench. I don't know what I'm doing. I want to put it where the city removed a bench, and I want it to really stand out. Can you help me make it stand out? And they said, bet, I got you. So <laughs> I built a bench. It was more billboard than bench. And what ended up happening was this monstrosity right here. Now, it stood out. It looked beautiful. And here's a side note. I put this line, I'm not sure if you can see with the lights, we put this line, this bench is illegal, but it shouldn't be. 
Now, the night before we went to install it, that last line, I noticed a letter was missing. And this is important. This is, this is funny. And I came to him and I said, hey, this, this, this letter is missing. We've got to fix something. He's like, I got an idea. He put this high visibility signage over it. He rewrote the line and it really made it pop. I was like, actually, it kind of looks good. It looks great. When this bench would go viral, multiple people would comment. They would say, oh, I love the intentionality. I love how you had that yellow strip <laughs> calling back to the caution tape in the first project. <laughs> and I'm just like, yeah, that was totally on purpose. <laughs> but when I went to place this bench, I took a play from my friend and neighbor, Vidi. You see, Vidi is responsible for getting the first community fridges here in town. And when Vidi decided to put in a community fridge, she didn't start with a patron funding contractors or some philanthropists bankrolling a big operation. She engaged the community, something known as mutual aid. Yeah, if you want to serve a Chattanooga community fridge, you can buy food, you can donate money, you can donate your time and clean it out. But she also gave ways for other people, other ways for other people to participate. Just walking by the fridge, you could snap a picture and upload it to your Instagram story. That alerts other people to a need or a resource that's in the fridge. The people being served by the fridge were given opportunities to serve the fridge. And it was this sort of optional participation, this mutual aid, that when we decided to put this bench in place, we put a call out saying, hey, if you see this bench, you can really help us out by posting a story on your Instagram, and that way we can know if and when the city decides to remove it. This created a virtual cycle. The bench took off. It was picked up by local news organizations. The video we posted on TikTok got three million views, and we got 100,000 followers from this one placement. But the most important thing is that the bench that this represented was replaced by the city within 72 hours. <laughs> if direct action awakens an individual, it's mutual aid which awakens the community. We leveraged this momentum to launch our Benches for Bus Stops campaign. We started holding mutual aid parties for wood prep, wood collection, painting. And as a result, we were able to build or inspire other people to build on their own upwards of 40 benches that have been placed around town. By this time next year, there will be more Chattanooga Urbanist Society benches than there are benches that are covered, provided by CARTA itself. The third and final awakening has to do with replication. It wasn't long after we were getting attention that we started all these little fires everywhere. People from across the country were wondering how we could start an official chapter of our organization in their town. <laughs> now, if you know me and the people associated with this group, you know we have more in common with three raccoons in a trench coat trying to pull something off <laughs> than we do with any sort of organization. And while many people had great ideas on how we might go wide with this project, and frankly will one day, we decided to double down and go deep and try to replicate here in our community. And we identified two key values for doing this. The first was inclusion. The second was education. Inclusion meant giving opportunities for everybody who wanted to to get involved. Because once they have opportunities and direct action, they're activated, they're awakened. Education meant they learned not just what they needed to know, but how to teach others. And that's how you multiply this effort. The first event we held specifically towards this end was something we were calling trash talk. You showed up in one of the most inhospitable sp spots in town. We were going to walk down the street, pick up trash, and talk about what we saw. Picking up trash is something most people could do. But I even welcomed people to come who couldn't do it, because just your presence increases the visibility of pedestrians. Easy task, picking up trash, just showing up, inclusion. Talking about what we saw and what we were doing and how to translate that into other areas and point that out to other people, that was education. In fact, a CARTA board member named Corey, a friend of mine, showed up and started talking to us about public transit. It was great. But this event was when we first met Taylor. Taylor showed up and just didn't stop showing up. Taylor stood up, and when people like me would have a mindset of, I can't pick that up, I don't have a truck, Taylor would think, since I don't have a truck, I'm going to have to do it in two goes. 
And he came at the right time because I was about to leave the country for eight months right as this started taking off, and I was looking for people to lead projects. Taylor stood up and led one of our most important projects to date, the pedestrian accident awareness signs. We saw early on this alarming statistics of pedestrians and cyclists being swept under the rug after they were just fatally killed by vehicles, and we decided to make these signs. We uh, painted them white, we put a black logo of a person getting hit by a car, and then we hand wrote in the date, and we put it on a telephone pole near where the accidents took place. Some telephone poles around town have three to four of these signs on them just from the last two years. Taylor led this group with the ambition of putting 90 plus signs around town. Now listen to me, is Taylor an uh, 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 established community organizer? Was he a teacher by profession? Was he a carpenter? He was none of those things, but he became a version of all of those things because first and foremost, he was included and then given not just what he needed to know, but what he needed to know to teach others. I remember Corey, the cardboard member who showed up? Corey started making his own benches on his own time. They look different than ours. They're bright green. You might see them around town, silently and anonymously setting them up. We saw, see, we saw some seating in Eastlake that was not associated with us. On 23rd Street and on Brainerd, they were popping up everywhere. And it's amazing how when you awaken people who want to help, who care more about helping than get credit for helping, how the work multiplies. So let's put these three awakenings together. Because the life and vitality of a city is measured by the life and vitality of the pedestrians. And in this fact, Chattanooga is failing. But a group of citizens, not limited to the Chattanooga Urbanist Society, are taking action to bring about change. Direct action, which is awakening individuals. Mutual aid, which is awakening communities. And then replication through inclusion and education, which is expanding these efforts. We don't anticipate to wake up tomorrow, the city to do all of our work, and for us to become irrelevant. We don't think that that's likely. What we want to do is awaken a community that doesn't need to wait for a hero. And then the city can follow our lead in creating more equitable forms of transit, housing, businesses, and public spaces. This is a movement happening all across America, going by different names, but with eyes on every action we're taking here in Chattanooga. And the Chattanooga Urbanist Society is ready and willing to work with anyone, but will wait on no one. Thank you.